Thank you so much for the invitation. Very excited to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, this work that we've been doing called Palette, which adds locality locality back to serverless functions. And this work is research work that's going to appear in your assist next time in 2023. And it's done with some people from Azure Systems Research. You heard from Daniel earlier today as well. Um, Gohar, who is now at MIT, was a member of the team. Uh, Jose, who left MSR. And a few interns, uh, including Mania, Charles, and Sam. OK, so just, just for context, um, I'm we are from this Azure Systems Research Group, which is a, a research group that is inside of Azure Core that left uh, MSR recently, and we're not affiliated or we're, we're not the Azure Functions team, product team, although we do have a very close collaboration with them in, uh, for example, our serverless in the wild paper in 2020 is mostly in production. We had a paper on introducing a fast cache from SOC 21, which is also partially in production and a couple of the other things as well. So, but what we do do work in, independently of, of the product. So I'm not gonna speak for the Azure Functions product. Uh, but, okay, so a lot of people here like on this work in this workshop know about serverless and I'm, I'm gonna talk specifically about function as a service. So thanks, that was, as was you know, introduced in 2014 by AWS, for example, Azure Functions is another one. And you know, it has been gaining a lot of popularity since it started. And mostly because you know it's a very simple abstraction, event triggered code that you upload to the cloud, scales to zero, and pay only as you go. And, and I like to say that, you know, if everything else being equal in this model, serverless is, is the rational choice to make. Uh, why would you pay for the burden? of being wrong in your allocation decisions if the cloud provider is willing to do that for you, right? However, if you deal with state in your execution and, and you know many, many applications do deal with state, everything else is currently not equal, right? The price that you pay for the simplicity is currently some lack, lack of control in, in how your program works. This, gives a lot of freedom to the provider so that the provider can allocate things and, and manage things in, in a flexible way. But in particular, this gives no way to the user to reason about locality. And because of the stateless nature of serverless functions, there's a separation between compute and storage. It's, it's good, right? Every invocation is, is equal from the point of view of the providers. It's very easy to load balance, for example. There's no promise. Uh, of where an invocation will run. And this makes the platform essentially be a, a data shipping platform. Uh, as our, uh, Joe Hallerstein and friends uh, talked about in this, this famous serverless computing one step forward, two steps back paper from 2019. And this means that most or all accesses to data from one function must cross a network hop even if you have functions that are talking to each other, which is also uh, hard. So this causes a big performance gap between several full versions of the applications. And you know, we showed that you can add caches. For example, you can add a global memory, a global variable to your function. And if you're lucky and the next invocation comes in the same instance, so that instance is still alive, that global variable actually is still there. So you can cache your machine learning model there if you want. Uh, but you have to be lucky. And this fast paper that we wrote, and as, as well as another system called OFC, creates a serverless cache among instances of the same function. And you can actually get data. If, if data doesn't hit in your local cache, you could potentially get it from a peer instance of the same function. Uh, but, but this is still um, crossing that network hop. So as an example of an application that suffers from this gap, is we, we can look at DAG processing. So uh, the previous talk talked about Dask, which is this Python framework for running uh, data processing. And we implemented a, a benchmark for parallel computing called TaskBench 
on top of Dask, and we implemented Dask as a serverless uh, application, a serverless version of Dask. So we separated the storage from the compute such that each invocation becomes, each, each node in the DAG becomes an invocation. And we added the fast cache to, to the setup. So we have several instances of a sort of serverless function running. They have a fast cache among themselves. So you can actually put intermediate data to, uh, to blob storage, but it gets cached in, in the fast cache and then a peer nodes if you run a function that reads the input from the previous one, you can read directly from the cache. So, so we, we ran this and we also, after we ran this task, some of the task bench tasks on our serverless task, we logged the compute time of each function and the transfer time between the functions. And we fed this into a, an optimal solver to compute what would be the best placement of of tasks on the set of nodes to minimize data transfers and maximize parallelism. And so our serverless version of Dask, we call oblivious because every, every invocation goes to a random instance of the function that is running. And optimal is as our, our best case. And, and you notice that there's a huge gap, right? Between the time that it takes this is just runtime, and this is on the on the x-axis. We have different types of benchmarks from from task bench, and and all the benchmarks, you know, it's it's been at least two or three times slower to run um, on the same machines, but with this oblivious placement that doesn't know anything about locality versus optimal, which which tries to minimize data network transfers and maximize parallelism. So this is really pretty terrible. Um, so we set up then to ask the following question. What is the smallest change that we can make to the function as a service API that we have? The simplest one, right? Not, not the one that adds DAGs or anything that enables us to recover most of this performance gap. So can we change the interface a bit and recover most of this performance gap that, that we lose due to lack of locality? And so this is exploring one point in the design space. Uh, we still want to provide the same type of freedom to the provider and maintain the simplicity to the user, so, such as, so this is to say that the serverless nature of the platform. And we also strived to look at something that is easily deployable. This is not to say that this is the only way to add locality to, to serverless functions. And, and people have done this in other ways. For example, if you express the entire DAG and send the DAG as, the, as your invocation, then the platform knows a lot about where data will be accessed and, and can actually place things together. So CloudBus, for example, is a work, uh, is a paper that does that. Uh, there's a paper called Wukong that actually shifts a lot of the complexity to the function. The function is, that they submit is very clever and, and they can actually spawn other functions and, and decide to, to run entire parts of the DAG in a single function. So they, they also man, manage to maximize locality, but it's, it's a specific for DAGs and it's quite complicated. And, and there are also other works that I like to call, that use serverless as small containers. So essentially you start a bunch of serverless functions and you have a controller machine, these call back into you with a TCP connection, and now you can farm work to them. But, but this is really, you're paying for those instances for the entire time that they're running. And so they're essentially just containers that you can start and stop quickly. So I, I, that's not entirely serverless, although they use the, the serverless platforms. So again, can we maintaining the same interface or, or with a small change to the serverless and fast interface recover and, and be able to express locality? And our answer to this is uh, valid. So throughout the talk, I'll, I'll go through two running examples. One, uh, like a representative of, of a web service backend, like a social network, uh, web API, and the other one, DAG processing. So the social network, is, is very simple uh, conceptually. So let's say that you have Alice and Bob and they have a common friend, Charlie, and they both want to read Charlie's posts in their respective timelines, right? 
And if you have several instances of the function, it's likely that the load balancer will direct Alice to one of the instances and Bob to the other one because the load balancer doesn't know anything about which functions are related to each other, right? So what, what ends up happening is that Charlie's posts will very likely be cached on multiple instances. And this is wasting space in the cache, right? So you also, they will miss. You have compulsory misses in all the caches and, and the extra network traffic and so forth. In the case of drag, drag processing, we already saw that you can have this huge gap. And one of the reasons is that if, if you're doing DAG processing as we did in the serverless way, because we were using the simple fast API, there's no way for the serverless system to know that two invocations are related to each other, much less that they should be you know, placed close to each other when they run. So palette is this way that we came up with of allowing users to express affinity between multiple executions and multiple invocations of functions. And when we do this by adding what we call callers to, to invocations. And the semantics is that the, the serverless platform will try to route invocations that have the same caller to the same instances. So it's, it's very simple. We're not telling uh, the platform to run anything in, in a specific instance, we're just saying, you know, these two red functions, please run them in the same place if you can. And it's important to note that the caller is an opaque locality hint. Uh, and, and each of these terms is important, right? Opaque means that the, third, the platform is not interpreting the meaning of the caller itself. It's just like, it's, it's, just, a, it's just comparing, you know, these two binary blobs are the same color, so I'll, I'll try to run them in the same place. So it doesn't interpret them in any way. Locality is, is, is just what we want to express as, as affinity. And it's a hint. Because we want to maintain the serverless nurture of the platform, we still want to give the provider the freedom to even ignore the hint and still maintain correctness. So performance might be worse, but it's, you don't suffer if you ignore the hint. And, and the scope of colors is a user application or a user function. In, in Azure, we, we have this notion of applications for a user, which, are, which is a set of functions that gets loaded and, and, and unloaded together. So this just means that there's no interference or sharing of data or colors between users. So this is what the system looks like, a sort of typical serverless platform looks like. You have a bunch of invocations by users and they get to a load balancer that and then there's a component that decides whether or not to scale the, the number of instances. And then you have workers that, that process the invocations. Um, with Palette, you add two things. First is that the users now can decide on a coloring policy. And instead of having a function of, of whatever parameters you have, you now have an extra parameter, which is the color. So, Invocations get to the platform optionally annotated with this color. And the other component, which is controlled by the serverless platform, is a different load balancer that has a color scheduling policy. So the pallet load balancer looks at, okay, I'm going to send all the red invocations to the worker on the top, all the green invocations to the worker in the bottom, and the blue and the purple invocations will happen to go to the worker in the middle. And, and so we can specify or, or think about how to use, how, how to define these two policies, right? So first question is how do we use palette? What, what are some possible coloring policies that users can actually uh, utilize to, to make good use of the platform? So in our example of the social network, one simple thing that we could do to, to avoid, you know, Charlie's posts loading in several instances is to just say, okay, I'm gonna, if I do a, a request for a post with a certain post ID, I'm gonna add post ID as the color of the request. So this will make, mean that every request for that post ID will go to the same server. And we can do that for different objects in the, in the API. For DAG processing, we can, we can do then many different policies and actually optimally coloring a graph uh, when you, even when you know the sizes of the data 
and and what and the topology and so forth. Uh, it's it's an NP hard problem. So we have heuristics, and one of them is what we call chain coloring. Is just try to let's try to look at long chains of nodes in the graph that call each other, call them the color them the same color, and then we avoid other transfers within the chain. And so we could partition this graph, for example, in these two chains, the red and the blue. Uh, there's another interesting way that we can uh, use uh, color graphs, which is what we call this virtual workers uh, approach. Essentially, we can reuse the logic, the locality logic that particular applications may already have. So in the case of, of the Dask scheduler, for example, it knows a lot about where data is in, in, in workers when it's running with distributed workers because it, it wants to enforce locality. So what we do is we trick this, the Dask scheduler and we can, we can do this for other, um, other systems as well. We trick the Dask scheduler by creating a number of shim virtual workers that the Dask scheduler thinks are just full regular workers and they proxy invocations to our serverless system. And so the interesting thing though, is that we create one worker per caller. And so the desk scheduler is gonna send, for example, these two top nodes to this red virtual worker and every invocation that this worker will make to the system will automatically color, be colored red. And everything that the lower virtual worker does will be colored blue. So the desk scheduler sees these in, as nodes and thinks, oh, okay, I know that the data produced by the first node is in the, in the blue node. I'm gonna send another invocation there. And so this has the effect of kind of mirroring the locality policy of the desk scheduler towards the, the actual uh, serverless system. Okay, so, so this is two examples or three examples of how to use the the coloring API, uh, by no means is this an exclusive, uh, exhaustive way that you could have very flexible policies. The other question then is how do we implement the, the load balancing itself? How do we schedule requests of different colors to, to workers? Uh, so we assume that the load balancer knows the number of running instances for each application, and these are the targets potentially the potential targets for each color. And we, we experimented with three colors, color scheduling policies. The simplest one of them is just to hash, right? To can say, okay, we have to say, make sure that all red invocations go to the same worker. Let's just hash the color and the worker for color C is just a hash of C. The problem with this policy, although it worked great, is that you have a classic random balls and bins problem which has uh, some load imbalance. And, and this, especially if you have a small number of nodes, this can be very significant. So to solve that, we can say, okay, uh, hash is simple, has this problem. Let's actually create a table in the scheduler, in the load balancer. And we can use a policy, for example, like least assigned worker. Let's, if a new caller arrives, look at the, all the workers, how many callers they have assigned to them and assign the color to the least assigned, the worker with the least number of colors. And the problem with this policy is that the stable can grow large. For example, if in the social network example, one color per user ID for object ID can be very large. So uh, we can solve this by using an LIU policy in this table. It's like a colors, like you can forget mappings. Again, hints mean that it's gonna be okay. And another one that we can do is similar to what Redis distributed does, is we can, uh, we call this bucket hashing. We can hash the color um, and then use a fixed number of buckets uh, to, to assign colors to. So a policy is that a new color can be mapped to a bucket with least colors. And then we, so we hash colors into buckets and then we assign the fixed number of buckets that we have to the workers. And this can still be unbalanced, but it's way better than hashing and, and, and can work really well in practice. So we, we experimented with these three, the two bottom ones have very similar performance. So let me let me just show some results. So I won't have time to show all the results, but some, some of the results. With the social network, we generated the synthetic trace uh, using some, some snapshot of, of a 
a small snapshot of Facebook users from, to, uh, from 90, uh, this, um, actually, I don't know which year this is from, but we created, we created a, a workload that, that generates a network of users. They, they have their posts, they have their friends. Each post has a variable number of images and texts and so forth. And uh, we use this policy that we color uh, this, these calls get user timeline, we color it with the user ID, get post, we color with the post ID, get media, we color with the object ID. And we run this with up to 24 instances that have local memory caches, not distributed caches. And the, the result is, is really that we, what we expect, that we manage to partition the cache space of objects among the instances. So this graph shows as the number of function workers increases, it means that the number of cache instances also increases. And you would expect that the hit rate right, would, would increase as well, because you have a bigger cache. Now, if you're doing oblivious routing, the hit ratio doesn't increase, because essentially every single cache will be independent and be caching, will, so they have the same size, and they'll have they'll be have the same perform. They'll be caching the same objects and missing on the same objects. Instead, if we if we partition this the space by by their object IDs, every object is going to be cached in only one of the instances, and the hit ratio increases as we increase the number of caches. Um, the other example is that, that I want to talk about is is Dask. So as I as I showed, we we implemented Dask in a in a serverless way, uh, and then we implemented the palette and, and different coloring policies for Dask. So we evaluated uh, this on a cluster of 48 workers, that, on serverless workers, and we also compared against a servo full Dask that was running on the same set of servers. And we essentially compared four of the scheduling, four different scheduling policies in, in our load balancer. So the, Given a fixed coloring of the graph, we're just looking at different effects of the load balancing policy. So the first one is, and, and we do this along two dimensions. One is adding locality. The other one is adding load balance. So the first one is oblivious and random. So we just, every invocation goes to a random server. So this is bad because it has no locality. It's also bad because it's random. So it has the same balls and bins in balance. We can fix the load balancing a bit by, for example, making the requests go to round robin fashion, they'll have the same uh, number of requests. And then we can shift from oblivious to respecting colors uh, going, going down this dimension here. If we, if we do pal palette consistent hashing, we have locality, but no good load balancing. And if we do palette with the least assigned color table, then we have locality and load balancing. So, so this graph here shows uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different uh, task bench benchmarks, and we have four bars here for each one of those four policies, and everything here is relative to the black line, which is the, the time that server full task took to run these 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 tasks. So we see that the same huge gap between uh, oblivious and, and servo full task and optimal is, is obviously even better. Um, and we see that we have different effects of, the, of, the, of those two dimensions, right? There's a jump between the red and the orange, which is when you add load balancing to oblivious and a jump between uh, you know, the two palette ones when you add, when you go from table, from, from hashing to, to the table. And, and then there's a much bigger jump when you add locality, right? When, when you transfer less data on the network. And we averaged all these differences and we can summarize them here. And, and you see that you have an, at least a 45% reduction in runtime when you add locality by, by coloring the, the nodes of the graph. And, and as, you know, between a seven and 11% increase when you, have, when you add uh, load balancing as well. Uh, we also ran, implemented TPCH on top of Dask and we ran all the 22 queries. Uh, we, this is not too big. We did 48 single threaded instances and small memory on each one because we were trying to mimic the current serverless uh, environments. So the total data was two gigabytes. 
We implemented this on server for desk, which is the black dashed line. Oblivious is the orange and palette with least assigned is, is the blue. So oblivious round robin transfers almost six times more data over the network than when we use um, callers. And palette is on average 40% faster than oblivious. And in, in a lot of the queries, nine of the queries, we were within 15% of desk server full desk performance. And in some others, we were a lot worse. We were like a, a, a 75% or more slower. And this is mostly due to, to serialization overheads we had and in Python uh, queuing delays. I don't, I don't have time to discuss a bunch of things. Um, and, and you can find actually the paper that will be published near CS23 if you go to aka.ms.azsr. And to summarize, yeah, there are other things. But, but I'd like to, to, to just summarize, like palette is a super simple extension to the FAS API. It, it offers the separation of concerns between users and, and the platform. And you can recover a lot of the benefits that you lose uh, when you don't have locality, right? In, in serverless invocations. And, and just to wrap up, um, I'd like to kind of connect to, to the topic of the, of the workshop. Like even, even if in a different, uh, Context locality is crucial for for many applications to match their server for performance and palette is, is a generic way of expressing this locality. I think it can be generalized and used in other contexts as well. We don't know exactly how serverless will evolve to run under disaggregated uh, settings. There's many potential options, right? But I think still, like, obviously, fundamental latency limits will still apply because of physics. Uh, we saw Daniel's talk today, for example, the difference between CX and RDMA. And so going forward, uh, for us to, when we do serverless in disaggregated environments, uh, locality is going to remain extremely important. And, and Palette is just one point in the design space to, of expressing that. So, so with that, I'd like to, to end. Thank you so much. And, um, just a plug for, for our new research group in Azure. If, it's, uh, if you wanna do research in cloud computing, how Ron can attest to that? Is it an awesome place to, to, do, to do that? So ping us for intern and FT opportunities uh, in the coming year. Thank you. Yes, um, let's thank our presenter for the great talk. Um, any questions from the audience? Oh, oh, someone raised their hand. Hi, can I ask a question? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, so I was wondering, like all these requests, uh, do they share the same memory space in the computer if they come parallelly? Like, do they share the... Uh... It, it depends. Now, usually if they go to the same instance, uh, usually in the, in the cloud, like depends on the cloud platform. Like for an Amazon AWS, for example, each request will be, no two requests that run in parallel will ever share the same instance. Right, exactly. Yeah, so I was wondering like how then in the social network uh, application, right. if them request an image, maybe there are two images in the storage and in that case, how is that even? So, so what happens in that case is that we used a, a a trick that all the platforms uh, recommend that you do if you want to cache data, which is, it, let's say that you run your function in Python, you create a global variable called cache, which is a, like, you can make that a hash, a dictionary. And then you can store, you, you can load objects from, from the backing store if you don't have them, but you, you check in the cache first. So, and, and this global variable persists across invocations. So it's it's a it's a weird model, uh, I would admit, right? But they, if if the instance hasn't died, right? The yeah, it, it has to be belong to the same application and the same user and so forth. But so True. you can basically leave state behind that it will be accessible. You can also do that for temporary. Yes. Space. So yeah. like the container should match the function, right? Is that that is what you meaning? The fu functional container should be matched with the next request. Yeah, so, so the way this works is that for each function that you have registered, 
you, you will have zero or more containers that are active and any of them can receive an invocation for that function. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so as long as you hit enough a container that had been hit before, yeah, you could do that. And so what we do is is make sure that the load balancer will try to do that. If you color things properly, then you will be directed to the same one instead of being randomly assigned to one. But you're not proposing that the containers, even if the user hints that, mm -hmm. the two containers share the same cache. You're not hinting at that, right? No, no, no. So the okay. you can think that you can think of the load balancer as like, oh, I have three workers. This is going to be the red worker. This is going to be the, the blue worker. And if I get a request, an invocation that has the red color, I'll yes. try to send it to the red request, to the red container. 